So I'm going to start off with the real reason that Mark and I and most of our colleagues got into this. We were not getting into this to grow algae and make money. There's a lot of small companies out there that grow algae and produce sort of niche products and make a lot of money doing it. But we got into this because we were really interested in solving the climate problem. And as you all know, carbon dioxide's been increasing. Um, and uh, I'm fortunate enough, I get to bring my classes to Hawaii every year and we get to go up to Mauna Loa. So I get to see where they make the measurements. And just two months ago, we were up there and it was 414 parts per million. And of course, this is the time of year when it's at, at its highest. Um, why are we worried about that? Well, if we look back um, at the uh, ice core records from Antarctica and look at the proxy reconstructions of CO2, methane, and temperature, uh, we can see these fluctuations up and down. And we see when temperature, when CO2 levels were high, we had high temperatures. And then when CO2 levels went down, we had low temperatures. And you know, this is sort of the kind of variability that we see going back 800,000 years. Um, and of course, um, this is where we are today. And if we continue with business as usual, this is where we'll be by mid-century. So this is why we're concerned. Um, now, Mark and I both got into this. Our, our backgrounds, we're, ocean, we're oceanographers. And you might wonder, what is an oceanographer doing um, trying to grow algae? And you know, I'm in a department that is, has a lot of atmospheric scientists. And I'm like the only oceanographer. And I'd like to remind them that the climate problem is really an ocean problem. It's not an atmosphere problem. Because it's really, the ocean provides the memory in our climate system. While the atmosphere really plays a central role in our weather, it's the ocean that plays a central role in our climate. And that's because water has this high heat capacity. And so it provides the thermal inertia um, in Earth's climate system. Now, most of the uh, CO2 uh, uh, ends up in the ocean and also most of the heat from greenhouse warming uh, over the last 50 years uh, ends up in the ocean and in fact it's like 93 percent of it uh, ends of that heat from greenhouse warming ends up in the ocean um, and as it equilibrates as this heat builds up it'll eventually equilibrate with the atmosphere and the atmosphere's temperature will rise now there's a what this leads to is the fact that even if we were not to increase greenhouse gases in the atmosphere starting today, we are already committed to an increase in temperatures in the future. And that's often referred to as the warming in the pipeline. Now, a lot of people have probably, who've been following the climate literature may have heard about this warming in the pipeline, but many people aren't really aware of um, the flip side of the warming in the pipeline. And that's the irreversibility of climate change, at least on, on what we consider human timescales. So it's the ocean's thermal inertia that's slowing down the warming of the Earth's atmosphere today that's also going to slow down its cooling in the future. So even if we're able to reduce the levels of CO2 in the atmosphere to lower levels, um, if we've already reached a dangerous equilibrium temperature between the ocean and the atmosphere, we're essentially locked into those temperatures for the next thousand years. So what that means you know, in practical terms is that we have a very narrow window of time, just on the order of decades, to solve this problem before we commit ourselves to truly catastrophic climate change. So what do we need? to do globally to avoid this catastrophic climate change? Well, as many of you are aware, and probably all of you are aware, um, in 2015, after 25 years of negotiations that many times didn't seem to be going anywhere, most of the world's countries agreed in Paris to try to limit global temperatures to two degrees and a, a two degree increase since pre-industrial times. And to pursue additional efforts to limit the increase to below one and a half degrees. Now, the commitments that, that countries have made are not going to get us to either of those. But let me just kind of review for you, and I'm going to try to go through this quickly. 
um, what this means. And this is from the, um, one of the previous IPCC reports. And basically, what it shows is this is the 50% probability of hitting these different target temperatures here. So this means that um, this is how much CO2 we can emit oops, to achieve these temperatures. So if we want to hit uh, two degrees, for example, what this says is that we can um, emit a, about 1,000 gigatons uh, between now and 2050. And then this is how much is left in our cumulative uh, CO2 budget um, during the second half of the century. But I'm, I, I don't know about you, but I don't really like the idea of just having a 50-50 chance of avoiding catastrophic climate change. So I prefer to use this other part of the figure where we're looking at an 80% probability of being able to stabilize temperatures at these targets. And what you can see is here, let's, I'm gonna focus on two degrees, um, and I think you'll see why in a little bit. Um, basically, we have a, roughly 1,000 gigatons of CO2 that could be emitted from the beginning of this century to 2100. And as you can see, we've, uh, most of that, it, we can burn most of that in the first, you know, half of the century, but that's not going to leave very much in the second half. And in fact, if we look more closely at this two degree uh, carbon budget, now this figure was made back in, uh, in about 2011, we'd already burned this much of the, uh, we emitted this much CO2 of what we can emit by the middle part of the century, and this is how much was left. And then just to kind of put that into context, this is our global fossil fuel reserve. So this is why you often hear people saying we have to leave <laughs> roughly 80% of our fossil fuel reserves in the ground, otherwise we're going to be, you know, exceeding these, these budgets. Now why... You know, for many years we talked about trying to stabilize at two degrees, but then we realized, oh, you know, one and a half degrees would really be, would be, really be much better. And there was a report that the IPCC put out this year showing just why it's that much more important to shoot for one and a half degrees. So we can see here um, the difference between one and a half degrees and two degrees in terms of extreme heat events. It's two and a half times roughly worse um, if we go to two degrees instead of one and a half degrees. If we look at the impacts on biodiversity, the impacts are two to three times greater if we go to two degrees instead of one and a half degrees. If we look at coral reefs, basically, if we go to two degrees, coral reefs will basically disappear from the planet by the end of the century. Um, if we go to one and a half degrees, we may uh, still have 10 to 20 percent of our coral reefs left. Not, not, not much to get excited about, but it's a whole lot better than nothing. And then if we look at the impact of fisheries, we can see that about two per, uh, there's about a doubling of the impact on fisheries if we go to two degrees instead of one and a half. So that begs the question, where are we now? Where are, we, where are these uh, emissions coming from? And if we look at the total emissions, now this is in terms of gigatons of CO2 equivalents. So this is not just CO2, but also the other greenhouse gases taking into account their, um, their different radiation factors. Um, and so where do, where do we go from there? We've got 49 gigatons of CO2. How are we going to reduce these? Because the reality is that we have to essentially reduce our emissions almost to zero by the middle of part of the century. And in many cases, certainly if we want to go to one and a half degrees, we're going to have to go and figure out how to achieve negative emissions, where we actually are, are reducing CO2 in the atmosphere uh, and, and uh, you know, below, where, <laughs> below zero, basically. Um, well, not not the concentration, but the emissions. Um, so in Mark, Mark's written a book um, that this talk is derived from, and he basically takes us on this five-step roadmap 
um, to 2040, showing how we can reduce uh, the emissions in the electricity sector, the transpo transportation sector, um, the heating uh, sector, agriculture and forestry, and then also processed gases. Now, I can't, in the amount of time I have, Mark could go through all of these for you. I'm gonna just focus on electricity, transportation, and, and just the implications of these things for agriculture and forestry. Now, there are a lot of people that work on electricity even here at Stanford. Um, you know, so I, I don't, I don't want to suggest that I'm an expert in this field. But the, but the argument is basically that um, right now, uh, the current greenhouse gas emissions that we have producing electricity can be reduced by 93% um, by 2040 from you know, our current levels just above uh, 14, sorry, uh, just above 14 gigatons of CO2 equivalents per year down to just 0.9 uh, gigatons per year. And what Mark was able to show uh, was that, you know, if we look at um, the growth of uh, photovoltaic solar and wind, those, if, we, if they continue on the same growth trajectories that they have in recent years, we can produce the 33,000 terawatt hours of, of demand that's electricity demand that we anticipate or project by 2035. So again, if we just stay on the actual growth rates for the past decade, this gets us to where we need to be. And so if we look at all of these different renewable sources, uh, potential renewable sources for electricity, um, you can easily produce those 33,000 terawatt hours projected for 2040. Um, and what, what we see here is that even if you make uh, you know, more conservative um, assumptions, so rather than the rates continuing at the rapid rates they are now, even if we go at half the actual growth rate for PV solar and half the growth rate uh, that we're seeing now for wind, um, and we use the actual growth rate for solar, uh, concentrated solar, uh, you can see that you know, from all of these different sources, uh, we can easily reach that demand. And uh, you know, some of these are limited by, by other things. Um, so hydro, you know, we, we already generate a lot of the potential hydro in the world. So there's limits as to how much more we can get from that. You can see at the bottom, uh, biomass is really limited by the amount of available land. Now, in terms of transportation, this is where things get really interesting. So, um, by 2040, Mark argues that the CO2 emissions associated with the transportation sector can be cut by greater than 100%. And this is interesting. Um, I'm not sure I would phrase it this way, but I'm gonna take you through the arguments that Mark makes. Um, so he argues that the transportation emissions can become effectively net negative. So here you can see we're going from, you know, uh, roughly a little bit over, maybe like about 11 gigatons of CO2 um, per year down to uh, negative eight. So how do, how do we do that? Um, so first of all, we're just gonna assume electrification of the light vehicle fleet by 2040. Um, now people can argue whether that's gonna happen or not, but it's, it, it is doable. Um, but we're still gonna need liquid fuels for other parts of the transportation sector. So this large blue area here corresponds to the light vehicles, but then we still need um, liquid fuels for many other parts of the transportation sector. So this would be things for like shipping, uh, whoops, uh, for jet aviation. Right now, we don't see a way uh, to avoid liquid fuels for those, but things happen, so you can't, you can't say for sure what the future holds. But anyway, we're gonna go with the fact that we are likely to need liquid fuels into the future. So how can we continue to use liquid hydrocarbon fuels um, and become effectively net negative? So this is where algae come in. So now, 
we've been looking at algae as a source of um, pot a potential source of fuel since the Jimmy Carter administration back in the 1970s. Um, and they hit, a, they hit a dead end in that research in the 90s, and, and the DOE stopped funding it. Um, Mark was involved with, with, with the concept that enabled us to get things back on track. And what that concept was, the problem that we had in the 1970s and 80s and into the 90s is that some people were trying to grow algae in open raceway ponds, and some people were trying to grow them in photobioreactors. And the problem with growing them in photobioreactors is that they're really expensive to scale up. And the problem with growing them in open ponds is the algae become contaminated by other species, including things that graze on them, as well as other things that, that compete for resources with them. The brilliant thing that Mark came up with was this hybrid approach, where you basically uh, grow the algae continuously in photobioreactors that are closed systems so they don't get contam contaminated. And then you take the algae out of those, you inoculate the ponds, you, give up, you put in a high enough concentration that the other things can't catch up with them. And basically, you grow the algae for two days in the ponds, and then you harvest them. Now, back when, when the DOE started this work, they were imagining, OK, we're going to collect the CO2 emissions from power plants. And we need CO2 um, to add to our algae in the open ponds. And the reason we need that is the algae are growing so rapidly that the CO2 can't diffuse through the air-water interface quickly enough to replenish the CO2 that the algae are taking up. And you know it's because the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere is pretty dilute. It's you know, now uh, roughly between 412 and 414 parts per million. So that's pretty dilute. So the idea was, OK, we need to add CO2. Now, if you do it from a power plant, and if it's a fossil-fired power plant, then you're still getting fossil CO2. Uh, or you're still getting fossil carbon into the mix. So if you then um, harvest these ponds, you process it, you produce fuels. Um, when you burn those fuels, you're still going to be releasing fossil carbon into the atmosphere. So you're not producing carbon neutral fuels. Okay, so that was a problem. You are getting one more cycle, but you're still releasing the um, the fossil carbon into the atmosphere. So, whoops. Another solution is that you combine growing the algae with direct air capture of CO2. So you eliminate the power plant from the equation here. And we've been in discussions with um, one of the groups that's developing direct air capture called Global Thermostat. Um, actually, one of their prototype facilities is just down the road here. Um, and they're already uh, talking about using the CO2 that they capture um, directly from the air to provide for algae. Um, in addition, it turns out that when you're capturing this, uh, this CO2 from the air, you about 80% of it is still there to, that you can sequester or that you could potentially utilize in other products, which would be my preference to produce products that actually generate revenue rather than just cost you to store it. Um, and then about 20% of it goes into the algae. Now, of course, because this direct air capture is taking CO2 out of the atmosphere, you're not introducing any new fossil carbon. So now you have the potential of producing carbon neutral fuels. And of course, really to do that, you need to make sure that the electricity that you provide is coming from renewables. Um, and then you can truly produce carbon neutral fuels. Um, and of course, if you produce other longer lived biopetroleum products like plastics and perhaps use those um, in the human built environment, then you have the potential to store that carbon um, in these long lived materials, essentially sequestering it. So then it actually becomes carbon negative. So people have only started to, to think about the potential for that. But I've always of the belief that if you want to store CO2, put it into a product that generates revenue rather than trying to pump it underground and it only costs you money. The other thing that's interesting, so there's 
Many of you have probably heard about um, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, or BECS. And uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot of interest in BECS. It's kind of a, it's a darling of the, uh, of the modeling community at the IPCC. So the, let me go through the concept here of how we would um, include, how we would do what we call ABEX, which is combining algal biomass production with traditional BEX. And the idea here is now um, we, we grow biomass. So in this case, this is eucalyptus. So a lot of our work's been in Hawaii, so I'll use that example. You grow eucalyptus. You burn the eucalyptus in your power plant. You collect the CO2. Again, that eucalyptus is collecting the CO2 from the atmosphere, so you're not introducing any new fossil carbon. Um, again, some of the CO2 you can sequester or utilize. The, other, uh, the remaining CO2 can go into your algae. And again, you can produce either carbon neutral fuels or you can produce carbon negative um, biopetroleum products. So just as a reminder um, about what BEX is, um, again, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, then you know, the modelers came up with this idea, but it's, they've been getting a lot of flack about it. And the reason they've been getting a lot of flack about it is because it re will require huge amounts of land, okay? And what that means is that you're gonna compete with agriculture um, for both land as well as for fresh water. And that has all sorts of environmental problems and sustainability issues. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things that it's going to do is it's gonna encourage deforestation and biodiversity loss as well. So you can imagine a lot of the ecological and environmental community don't think that BEX is such a great idea. So we decided we were gonna explore this idea with algae and take, run through an example to show people how algae can improve the sustainability of this. So we wrote this paper um, in uh, the journal Earth's, Earth's Future and basically showing how we can integrate uh, algae with BEX. So what we did is, okay, in this example, we're taking 2,800 hectares of soy cropland that right now is just producing soy. And we're replacing it with an integrated ABEX system where we take 80% of that area and grow eucalyptus on it. And we take 20% of it and grow marine algae on it. And basically we, we burn the eucalyptus in a power plant and that provides the algae with the CO2 and it also generates the electricity that you need to run your operations. But this is where it gets really interesting. This integrated ABEX system now produces more protein than that soy cropland did. And the algae protein is much more nutritious than the soy protein. And in addition to sort of getting uh, you know, the, the protein out of it, we're also reducing the land and freshwater demand and generating 61 and a half terajoules of electricity while sequestering 29,600 tons of CO2 per year. So what we've basically done now is we've, we're saying, okay, if you add algae to, to BEX, then you don't need to compete with agriculture and you don't need to compete with uh, terrestrial energy crops for fuels we can produce those because algae are typically an order of magnitude or more productive per, land, per unit area of land than terrestrial plants. And you, know, you can't sort of make these arguments without talking about economics and we, we work through the numbers and basically this becomes economically viable if you can get about $1,400 ton, uh, $1, per ton of algae and use that as a fish meal replacement. So that's current market value for fish meal. And if you get a carbon credit of about $68 per, uh, per ton of CO2. So, you know, I've thrown a bunch of numbers at you. I wanna show you where they came from. So this is a facility. Um, this is the research and development facility. It's called the Kona Demonstration Facility. It's right next to the airport. Um, in Kona, Hawaii. Um, this is uh, Kiahole Point. You can see there's a bunch of, of uh, algae being grown in open ponds 
right next door, um, those are being grown um, for astaxanthin and for spirulina. So these are, the, these are the niche products, high value products where you can make pretty good money, but they're not gonna solve world problems because you need to have markets, you need to have commodity markets in order to scale things up to actually make a difference uh, in the climate picture. Um, these are the photobioreactors here, and these are what the open raceway ponds. These are smaller than what you would have in a full commercial facility, but they're certainly of sufficient scale to give us uh, good numbers to work with to determine how, uh, how viable these things are, both in terms of costs and, and other sort of financial issues. So what are the advantages of marine microalgae? Like I said before, they have very high productivity. If you look at the um, oil yield per, per acre per year, here we have soy, uh, camelina, sunflower, jatropha, and oil palm. And you can see that the algae are at least in order of magnitude uh, more productive. Maybe not quite that over, over palm oil, but they are at least two or three times more productive per unit area than, than palm oil. Um, we can use, now the great thing is that we can basically do this on non-productive, non-arable land. The facility in Kona is actually on a lava bed in a desert, um, less than 10 inches of rain a year. So, you know, you don't need to compete with agriculture for land. And because we're growing marine algae, we don't have to compete with agriculture. All right. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, let's see if I can... Uh, Isn't it rude when your seminar speaker's phone goes off in the middle? <laughs> um, and then also, one of the other great advantages, in, advantages environmentally is that you don't get any fertilizer runoff. You don't get any downstream eutrophication. You don't get dead zones in the Mississippi, uh, you know, where the Mississippi River um, enters the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and that's because basically, the only nutrients that we lose in the process are the ones that end up in our products. All, any other remaining nutrients can, can, can be recycled. And in addition to fuels, we can, you know, we can produce other, other valuable co-products, food and, and, as I said before, potentially bioplastics and things like that. Um, and it's really interesting. We, got, you know, we started this work looking at fuels. Um, and it became very clear that algae are too expensive to grow to just produce fuels. And, what that, and so finally the DOE accepted that, and they said, okay, you need to look at co-products. But they were thinking fuels would still be the primary product, but that these other secondary co-products would just make the economics work better. Well, it turns out that, as you'll see shortly, um, the fuels are probably the secondary co-products, and the, the nutritional products, both for animal and aqua feeds, as well as for potentially human nutrition, are probably going to be the primary products. Uh, so this is a paper that, um, that I led uh, the writing of with all of our consortium members a few years ago, and basically what we wanted to do was sort of just do some back of the envelope calculations to see how things scaled up globally. And so what I wanted to do was say, okay, let's look at the 2016 liquid fuel demands of the United States, which was about 19.6 million barrels per day. And using the productivity numbers from our facility in Hawaii, the Kona demonstration facility, which is about half a barrel per hectare per day, it turns out that if you do the, these back-of-the-envelope calculations, it turns out that you need about 392,000 square kilometers. And that turns out to be about 4% of the U.S. land area and about half the size of Texas. Now, some people think that sounds like a lot, and it is a lot of land. But when you think about it, you're meeting all of the U.S. liquid fuel demands in an area half the size of Texas. And then we looked at, well, let's look at the 2016 global liquid fuel demand, 
which is about five times that of the US, about 96 million barrels per day. And when you go through these same sorts of calculations, it turns out that it corresponds to about 21% of the land area of the US, and it corresponds to about an area equivalent to three times the size of Texas. Then we did some calculations which really kind of completely changed our way of looking at things. We said, okay, if this is how much land we need to produce this much fuel, how much protein would we be producing simultaneously? And so, we, again, we took that, that same land area needed to meet the US transportation fuel demand, and we took our numbers of how much protein we produce simultaneously, and it turns out that we produced two times as much uh, protein as, as is produced from soybeans globally each year. And if we do that argument you know, for meeting the total liquid fuel demands of the world, we're producing protein that's 10 times the amount produced by soy globally each year. And you know, when, I, when I did those calculations, I went, we are not in the fuel business, we're in the food business. This is how we're going to come up with the protein that's going to feed nine and a half billion people by mid-century. So this is the global vision. Um, this is what the world looks like when you view it as, uh, as a potential place to grow algae. So the, the hotter the color in this picture, the better it is for algae, algae productivity. And so what you can see is that the places that you want to be growing algae are in the, in the arid subtropical regions of the world. These are deserts, not non-arable land, not used for a lot of other things. We don't have to compete with agriculture. We can go to the, you know, the, the deserts in, in South Africa. We can go to the Sahara. We can go to the Middle East. We can go to Northern Australia, the coastal deserts of Peru, uh, the Northern coastal desert of Peru, uh, Baja, there's a lot of places that are just sitting there waiting for algae to grow. Um, and then to just to kind of put things into perspective, this is what the si this is three times the size of Texas. So that's the amount of area that we need to meet the 2016 uh, liquid fuel demands of the world. Now I, I should say that this kind of misrepresents things a little bit because we're growing marine algae and we can't choose to do that like in the middle of the continent. You really need to do it along the coast. You need to do it within about 10 kilometers of the coast because after you move further away from the coast, the um, cost of transporting seawater inland becomes prohibitively expensive. But there's still a lot of places in the world where we could be growing algae and not competing with agriculture. So what are the key points here? So the large scale Industrial cultivation of marine microalgae on land can provide society with an environmentally favorable approach to meet those Paris climate goals. The liquid hydrocarbon fuels required for jet aviation, for shipping, and for heavy vehicles. Potentially produce carbon negative, long-lived biopetroleum products that can help us actually reduce the CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere and the protein necessary to feed a population approaching 10 billion people. And what I think is really interesting is the real climate benefits from this doesn't come from producing carbon neutral fuels. It comes from the fact that you can change the way we use land. Because if algae are producing, um, if they can produce biomass 10 to 100 times, somewhere in that range, faster than terrestrial land plants, what that means is that we can, in turn, produce the same amount of food and fuels from 1 tenth to 1 hundredth the area where we're currently getting it from terrestrial sources. And that means that we free up a tremendous amount of land for reforestation. So now these are sort of the, the you know, the, the grand statements here, but we actually went through the modeling exercise, and this is the paper that, that we're working on now, and basically um, we figured that a scaled up 
marine microalgae industry could profitably, and that's a really important term, profitably, uh, meet the projected global demand for animal feed protein, for vegetable oil, and for liquid transport fuel. So we're not even looking at direct human nutrition yet. We're just looking at, at aqua, aqua feeds, animal feeds, and, and vegetable oil. And if we, if we meet those demands, um, instead of using terrestrial crops, we would be able to conserve 18% of the global fresh water consumption. Agriculture requires a lot of fresh water. We'd be able to actually reduce 34% of wild harvest fisheries because over half of the wild caught fish in the world go into the production of fish meal. We would be able to, I'm sorry, not half, 30%. Um, we would be able to release 2.8 million square kilometers of cropland for reforestation. And then by looking at the combination of reducing fossil carbon emissions through the, through the use of fuels and also these changes in our land use, I mean, think of it this way, there there's, will no longer be pressure to deforest the Amazon for soy or to deforest Indonesia for, for palm oil we can actually lead to an emissions reduction of about 13 gigatons of carbon, carbon dioxide, not carbon, carbon dioxide per year by, 20, by 2040. And that's roughly a third of our, of our current CO2 emissions. And that's kind of what I think, that's why we got into this and we're really excited because this is, this is doable. Now, the big thing, of course, you know, we're, we're facing what everybody in Silicon Valley knows uh, as the valley of death, right? Where you are between R&D, which is what we've been doing, and the modeling, and actually bringing things up and doing things on a commercial scale. And uh, to, to grow algae properly, the appropriate scale is about at least a thousand uh, hectare facility. And, and something like that runs on the order of about a half a billion dollar capital investment. So we're going out there. You know, there aren't that many places in the world you can go for that kind of investment. I've made a couple of trips to, to Qatar. Um, and uh, we're, we're kind of doing this incrementally. We're looking at um, maybe going to the uh, seafood producers and, and uh, trying to develop uh, aqua feeds that that going that direction because we can go and make things commercially viable there right away. The, the problem I have with that is that this incremental approach isn't going to get us to solve the global problems that we need to solve because we only have about three decades to solve them. And I tell people we have about a decade left to figure out the technologies that we need and then we have about two decades to implement them globally. And if we don't do it in those three decades, then we're, we're on our way to catastrophic climate change and, and irreversible and all. So I'm going to leave it at that and open it up for questions. Uh, so I thought that was uh, provocative and eye-opening uh, from my point of view. Uh, can we start with some student questions as usual? Yes, over there. Hi, Corey. Um, thank, you, thank you very much. My question is, I'm still skeptical about the idea of uh, the whole uh, transfer sector being uh, uh, negative uh, in terms of CO2 emissions. My question is, for that to happen, how many hectares of algae do you need to use uh, to actually consume the CO2 that the company has made? Um, so I have to. I think after you electrify um, the light vehicle fleet, the demands don't exceed, aren't that much more. I think they're I think they're about twice what the demands were in 2016. Um, so uh, you would need potentially twice the area. So for the if the global demand. Uh, required an area three times the size of Texas in 2016, you would need an area six times the size of Texas 
by, you know, by 2040. Um, so uh, you, you would definitely be increasing, but you're, you're doing a lot more than what we had envisioned, right? Because now we're producing all of the, all of the um, aqua feeds, all of the animal feeds, all of the vegetable oil um, that we are, we're anticipating. Because there are gonna be a lot more people, right? I mean, it, it's really um, the addition of the people that's driving up all of this demand. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I was wondering if you could please give us a general outline of where in the world the best technology is currently being utilized, and also an indication as to which countries you think will be the leading AVEX market players in the future. You know, um, I'm not sure. There's, I, there's very few places where they're actually doing BEX right now. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, actually, the, the, the reason for that is you need advanced biofuels, and we don't have advanced biofuels right. yet. Right, and so, yeah, because the biofuels we have right now really don't, do, don't help us very much with climate. You know, most of those are being driven by... Um, Farmers wanting subsidies. Being, being one of the people guilty of Bex, uh, creating Bex euphoria, <laughs> I feel guilty of that. But there is a timing issue. We never said it, it needed to be done right away. Right. But this seems much more immediate. So where do you think the best locations are, other than Kona, which seems like the best place? Yeah. So I mean, what we'd really like to do actually is is develop a, a pilot scale project and and Hawaii would actually be quite good because you have a wet side and a dry side and you could grow eucalyptus on the wet side there's actually already lots of eucalyptus there that they've grown for other reasons so you, and the transportation of the eucalyptus well actually you you either transport the eucalyptus and then burn it in a power plant or you burn it in the power plant and you collect the co2 and transport the co2 but the distances aren't great so Hawaii would actually be a good place to try you know, to demonstrate to yourself that this can actually work more than, you know, pulling things from the literature in various places and putting them together in a model. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, we went through this exercise to show the possibilities. So you, you have a little bit of a conflict in demands, right? Because algae really need lots of sunshine. You need to be in a really sunny place. And if you want to grow terrestrial plants, they're in many parts of their world, they're water limited. So the places that I showed you, the arid subtropical regions in the world aren't exactly the best place to be growing terrestrial biomass. So, you know, it may turn out that you end up doing these things in different places and then you have to factor in what the transport costs are and whether it still makes makes economically viable sense. One of, you know, we, we got asked a few years ago by this Norwegian company that had tremendous amount of CO2 emissions. Um, and we were saying, and, and we we're saying, we don't want to grow algae in Norway. It's too seasonal an environment. But what we can do is we can capture the CO2 there. We can, we can turn it into calcium carbonate and we can bring it to the Middle East and, and it turns out that the shipping costs are such that it actually still remains economically feasible. Interesting. Uh, your question is for me. <coughs> um, in the back, way up, and then in the um, On your global map where you were showing the kind of sweet spots for algal production, you know, you followed that up by saying that, well, you really want to stay within 10 kilometers of the coastline for the energy demand of pumping water. And then in the inset, you had um, you know, the map of Texas as the representative. And so you took that global heat map and you took out all of the area that's not 10 kilometers from the coastline. You wouldn't have that much area left. And so I'm just trying to figure out how much of the total global coastline There's, would you consider. Yeah, we haven't, we haven't done that calculation. We're just starting to do a sort of a, a we've kind of been looking at global view right now. And now we're starting to do the country by country and regional um, assessment. So I haven't, I haven't got those numbers, but there is, there are plenty of coastal areas out there. Now there are other constraints on this too, because if you have CO2 requirements, right, um, you have to make sure that uh, you're close enough to your CO2 
that you can get it there again in a way that still makes economic sense. And uh, so one of the, that's one of the reasons why we're excited about potentially combining with direct air capture, because if you could combine that with concentrated solar and you did it like in the Middle East, then not only would you be getting your electricity, but you'd be getting your CO2 and you could, do, you could have sort of self-contained facilities almost any place in the world that you want to do it. So if, if you, you know, when we were working with Shell, um, you know, about a decade ago, they spent a number of million dollars, millions of dollars looking to see um, where in the world you could possibly do this. And they were thinking, well, you need to be near power plants, right? And it turns out that there were only like a half a dozen to a dozen places in the world where you were, you know, where you could find land that was cheap enough along the coast, but also be close enough to a to power plants, which means you're already close to, you know, where there are a lot of people. And when you get close to a lot of people, then the land costs go up. So the more self-contained your facility is, the better off you are. So the, I would say the biggest challenge we face going forward is to figure out how we can get the nutrients that we need at our remote locations. On the aisle there, sir. Yes, referring uh, to once again to the global map of suitable locations to grow algae, are there uh, risks vary in terms of contamination <coughs> according to location? And as a function of that, would you have to adapt the technology? Because I'm just thinking um, the surrounding um, biodiversity changes, so maybe the contaminants between the algae. Um, well, I'm not sure that that's an issue. We, have, we haven't thought about it deeply enough because we've, we've solved the contamination problem where we've done it by, by using the photobioreactors um, and, and then growing in the open raceway ponds for a short period of time. There may be places in the world where, you know, there are the, you know, where things are worse off. You know, I think one of the... One of the things I think is interesting, which hasn't come up here, but people have raised in the past, they go, you know, some of the places that you've, you've, you're pointing to are some of the most unstable places in the world, you know, like Saharan North Africa, the Middle East. And what I say is like, why are they unstable? Well, one of the reasons that they're unstable is because they're undergoing drought. There's not enough food for the people. And and people are going into the cities and they're unemployed. So now if you introduce an industry that's generating revenue, food, um, and jobs, and you bring it in, you know, yeah, these are unstable parts of the world, but you're actually potentially adding stability to those parts of the world. So I think that, I don't view that as a disadvantage. In the long term, I view that as an advantage. Uh. Let's see, do you have a couple more questions, sir? So, yeah, do you, do you have an estimate of what the capex is per gallon of fuel in the system, and does that include the land cost? Yeah, so we've done that. Um, we published a paper, Mark was the lead author on it back in 2015, um, and we played out like 20 different scenarios and went through the techno-economic analysis, because it depends on where you do it. Um, and how much land costs are, and what labor costs are. Um, and you know, so we did it in places like Hawaii, which are pretty expensive, and we compared it to Texas. But there's other parts of the world that would be much cheaper. Anyway, um, we typically found that if you were just growing the algae for fuel, on, you know, kind of best case scenario, everything's working well, it's about $10 a gallon. You know, and, and, and that was when we said, okay, fine, we're not going to be able to compete with fossil fuels. DOE had this objective of growing algae and trying to get it to $5 a gallon. And I just don't see that happening. But if you, but if you have these other co-products, um, you know, we've, we've done the calculations, you can basically um, almost give the fuel away because you're making so much money on, the, on like the aqua feeds. Can I sneak in an announcement uh, for the entrepreneurs in the house before we kind of start off on the last time? Thank you.
Um, thank you, Charles. That was a great talk um, and very relevant. Um, I'm with uh, my name's Julian. I'm with Climate Careers. Um, we are a startup that is uh, an employment platform for startups and nonprofits working exclusively on climate change solutions. Um, we are having a career fair on May 22nd. It's right now uh, at Impact Hub in Oakland, um, but we're probably going to move to San Francisco. Um, but we are hosting a career fair with companies, again, all of which are working on climate change solutions, um, including one actually working uh, on um, on uh, aqua feed. <laughs> um, and uh, they're looking for folks with technical skills. So if anybody's looking for a job or you know, working for an opportunity to work uh, on climate change solutions, we'd, you know, we'd love to have you there. Um, and come talk to me afterwards if, if uh, that sounds interesting. Thank you. With that, I'd like to thank uh, Charles one last time. It, it occurs to me, given all the dimensions you've recovered here, this is kind of sustainability writ large, which was the biggest single gripe about the simplistic Bex technology is it was simply not sustainable as soon as you looked in any direction. I can't say that you've looked in every direction, but it seems like you've looked at a lot of them, including income distribution and um, uh, so, so stability of social systems. So thank you very much for such an un, 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 uh, uplifting talk and a great tribute to Mark, your co colleague. So let's thank uh, Charles. Thank you.